So uh, thanks, thanks for listening. We're going to have a few minutes for questions, and then we'll be taking a break. Okay, so hang in there for just a few, just a few more minutes. We've just had two wonderful presentations about the force that is WeChat and how it, uh, you know, becomes the glue in people's lives and between people and other people, and the big paradox, this this question of how the United States and various American companies work in China and with Chinese partners and. I think this question that, that Matt has given us, messy engagement or standing aloof, but thinking that you're morally superior for it, is a central one, and one that comes up over and over and over. And so now we'd like to go to your questions. If you have questions for either of our presenters, I certainly have quite a few, but first yours. Please. Got a microphone. You, see microphone. You, you see something wrong within your community. Um, I know it's not. There's not necessarily a parallel between the United States and China, but you're seeing, um, at least when I was there, you're seeing a little bit more of a difference um, in terms of. Although there's some hot rail things I can't talk about, there is actually more exposure that I'm seeing in China. Do you find that? I, either of you. Sure. Uh, yeah, one one sort of take on that um, that studies of the of the way that internet censorship and the way that uh, blocks on communication work, oftentimes what they say is the transmission of information or just opinions mostly. If you want to say I don't like the government, I think that there's corrupt officials everywhere. That's traditionally not something that is going to necessarily be censored. What they're most concerned about is calls to action. I'm mad about this, and let's meet down at the corner and have a protest. That is very, very likely to be censored. So that's just one kind of dichotomy that is shown over time. I would say, yeah, the, the discussion, the conversation, the transparency around just issues existing is at an all-time high or near an all-time high, but the ability to organize around that or the ability to attack what you sort of describe as like the, you know, the third rails um, specifically questioning anything related to the supreme leader, Xi Jinping, um, or talking on a couple of sense, very, very sensitive issues. That's still a very hot button. But if you want to complain about you know, a trash pile up in your neighborhood, that's usually, th that's going to that's gonna flow relatively freely. So in terms of uh, the Chinese uh, the situation, I think there's always this uh, kind of two step forward and the one step backward. And I think that is, uh, in a way, that is uh, Chinese uh, over the past uh, 30 some years is uh, still follow that model. And I, I think at this point, it's kind of one step backward at the, mo at the moment. But you, overall, you can see that it's, so uh, the Chinese are still moving more and more. The door is uh, open and wider and wider, and the transparency it is also and clear and clear. So I think that's just like Matt mentioned that is certain things you cannot say, and the, li the red line is very clear. but other things, it's quite open. It's, if you look at that, it's a, we talk about 95% versus that 5% kind of things. And the 5% and cannot touch, but the 95% is quite open. Yeah, the censorship with regard to leaders and you know, following going, things like that, is absolute, right? Uh, but people find ways even around that. But one of the things that, that has come up is the notion that you're not supposed to turn into a citizen journalist, that you're not supposed to broadcast that a demonstration is happening now, that that sort of thing is being blocked. But complaining about generic corruption, generic pollution, something like that, all the time, everywhere. Next question, please. With regards to like rural Chinese, uh, how is the Chinese government or industry done a good job or lack thereof of creating infrastructure, communication, economic prosperity for those people who don't necessarily live in urban areas? Either of you. Um, sure, yeah. Uh, I mean, one of the main things has been not necessarily creating all the infrastructure in the countryside, but there's just been such an outflow of these immigrants to the cities. So in a lot of ways, rural issues 
happen in the cities. One of the big questions is integrating migrants who left their hometown into city social services. Are they able to send their kids to a school in Beijing if they went there to work? Are they able to use a hospital? So a lot of those issues happen there. Just in terms of internet connectivity and infrastructure, um, uh, electricity, electrification has reached 100 percent pretty much, which, you know, that sounds kind of like a no-brainer. But I, I went, in 2015, yeah. I went to a village where was actually the last village in this province of Sichuan to get electricity, the first, first time they're getting TV and stuff like that. And that's pretty game-changing. You also see Chinese internet companies having a very big emphasis on um, getting their e-commerce platforms out to the countryside. Taobao, the Alibaba platform, is making a big push into the countryside to try to bring those people online as consumers and producers, letting them you know, sell your organic little village vegetables to people in the city who want that kind of down-to-earth uh, veggie box or whatever. Um, so, you know, a lot to unpack there, but those are a couple areas. I, I think that is really the critical thing is the relativity. So if you look at the China and uh, uh, the rural and versus the urban development, uh, uh, at this point, it's a, I mean, there's a still large kind of, uh, kind of divide, dividing, and uh, in the rural area, there's a lot of things to catch on, and uh, how long that will take, and no one can tell. And th there's uh, so much problems and issues facing the peasants, the farmers in those rural areas. But if you compare with this uh, 38 years uh, to see how those people are changing, how the condition has been changed, that, that will be a tremendous. So there's a long way to go, but in the same time, and there's a lot of changes has been done. Yeah, this big initiative, broadband to every village, you know, this sort of thing. You've heard electricity, electricity just getting in in some places, but putting in broadband, particularly with educational emphasis, you know, trying to connect people to increase opportunities for those folks out there. Next question. Uh, please. I think that's me. Um, I am curious about data privacy and retention, because to me, with Facebook, the fact that my post got censored is less interesting to me than the fact that Facebook retains information about the fact that I tried to post something they wanted to censor, and maybe they can either sell or give that information. And so w what's the divide like with regard to that? Because that's an issue on both sides of that divide. Yeah, and so, in, and so part of that question having to do with the question of a social credit ranking mm -hmm. based on your participation in social media. Yeah. I mean, on the whole, I'd say data privacy, very, very poor over there. Um, a lot of examples of uh, just being able to buy information online and stuff like that. So that's very poor. They just implemented a new cybersecurity law that's supposed to help uh, improve data privacy. The law is also supposed to help the government assert more control and probably give government access to some of that data and keep the data stored over there. But in general, that's a very big issue. People. Uh, uh, sh should be worried, but the attitudes around privacy are much different over there. Here we really have that sense that, you know, don't peek in my email, don't hold on to my information. At least we're getting that sense with time. I'd say in China there's, there's just not that awareness, not that knowledge, or not, it, it, maybe it's just a value thing, maybe they just don't care. Data privacy is everywhere. It's, uh, in U.S., uh, the, the privacy is, uh, I mean, the companies can uh, easily sell those uh, information to other people for purchasing purposes. For China and those privacies, particularly uh, dealing with uh, the political issues, that can be uh, kind of in danger. So definitely it's, uh, it's a major concern over there. Yeah, and having the companies doing business in China have to store the data there, right? That, that makes a big difference. Maybe one last question. Yes, uh, in in regards uh, to that, having to store the the data there, uh, along with uh, the ownership of ventures, um, what Guanxi might uh, turn into in terms of greasing the wheels, and uh, the handoff of intellectual property, is uh, messy engagement um, really primarily about censorship, or is censorship really kind of a minor aspect of what that messy engagement looks like? Yeah, I'd say that's a very good point. Um, censorship is very much on the minds of people who are looking at the Silicon Valley tech companies from a you know, moral ethical perspective. But if you look at it from a business perspective, the question of uh, 
what the Chinese government is able to sort of milk out of these companies in terms of information transfer, uh, intellectual property transfer, that's another huge question. I mean, the Chinese government has done this in industry after industry with the car industry. The car industry goes into China. They say, well, you're welcome in. You just have to partner with a local firm, which involves a lot of knowledge transfer. And it means that China was able to build up its own car industry. You know, we don't like that from an intellectual property perspective. If you're, you know, the government looking out for the interests of Chinese auto workers, you probably feel like that's a big win. You know, you get, we're able to milk these companies for a lot of knowledge and stuff like that. In the technological area, it's, I don't know, it's a lot messier because there's so much interplay of people and so much of the, uh, so much of the information, at least on a macro level in terms of trends and ideas is broadcast publicly. Um, but yeah, that's from a trade secrets perspective. Uh, the government is probably looking just to squeeze every last ounce out of these companies. China has a lot of problems in intellectual property law, but I think that China has been changed drastically in terms of uh, setting up the law. And uh, nowadays, uh, just came back from China, and uh, so the, 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 the friend told me that it's, uh, everything they are doing is uh, you need uh, uh, you need to uh, you need to apply for the uh, the the, uh, the certification. I mean, all kinds of things. So I can see that the changes is coming and coming quickly. Okay. Well, thanks to our presenters for a wonderful, wonderful set of presentations.